break. It's an honor to be on the same program with Judith Yaros Lee. Uh, Judith and I have uh, teamed up, uh, ganged up on audiences before, and it's always been fun too. So I'm especially sorry that she's not here along with us. So Joe said that uh, well, there will be one and a half people <laughs> before you. Uh, I'm not sure which of us he was going to designate as the half, but I would be proud to be that half person. Of time and quantum mechanics and roughing it. Jeff, could you adjust the microphone just a little bit? Pull it higher up because you're a small guy. I, uh, I don't have the technical. Joe, is there a way to make the mic higher? Or so, if you, uh, turn that. Yeah, you turn that right there. We all. It might be the highest of the other way. Raise it, raise it, raise it. I understand the difference between up and down. I think that's it. I think that's it. My parents and I apologize that I don't think I can get any shorter at this point. <laughs> Holger, how are you? Can you hear me? Barely. Barely. <laughs> um, and yet in the back you can hear me fine. Holger, we're going to have to check your hearing. <laughs> well, let's see if I can make this work. Okay, good. Let me assure you that I'm about to launch into a perfectly relentless discussion of the fine points of quantum mechanics. But first, I want to ask you to indulge me in a little personal talk. I've been to every one of these Elmira conferences, way back to the very first. And what I'd like to do before I do anything else is to name four names of people I came to know here, or to know better here, in Elmira at this conference, and who are no longer on the planet. I find I can't be here yet again without acknowledging that for me, they are here too. They are Hal Bush, Mike Kiskus, Vic Doino, and Ham Hill. There are, sorry to say, many other fine spirits I could name as well, and maybe others of you will name them. I'm not going to rhapsodize about these four, just to name them. Harold, Michael, Victor Hamlin. Thank you. Being here and not here is in some respects the very essence of quantum mechanics. Although anyone who tells you he comprehends the essence of quantum mechanics is very likely a charlatan. If that dark truth makes you wonder about me, wait, does he know what he's talking about or is he just blowing cigar smoke? A question, believe me, you will entertain several times over the course of the next three days here in Elmira, that is a quantum mechanical moment. It's at its most quantum mechanical, or you are, when you allow both these conditions may be true simultaneously. Is this person speaking to us through the purple Elmira afternoon, a responsible enough Twain scholar or full to the gaskets with hot air. Take away the or in that question, and you experience what in quantum mechanics is called superposition, the capacity of a quantum object to exist in two or more seemingly exclusive states at once, in two or more places, for instance, or like Schrodinger's infamous cat, in two conditions, living and dead. More about that later. But just so I know, and since we have a little bit of time, is the expression Schrodinger's cat familiar to anybody? Yeah. Could you just raise a hand if you've... Okay, good, good. That, um, I, I will try to explain Schrodinger's cat when I get to him again, but uh, so don't panic if you don't recognize, um, but thank you if you do. Meanwhile, though, I'm going to sneak up on quantum mechanics and on roughing it by talking a little about time in The Great Gatsby. Oh, the cat, Schrodinger's cat, I'm sorry. I missed a slide. 
the Schrodinger's cat here represented as both alive and dead, but on to, I hope that's the great Gatsby. Yes. Despite what he says, Jay Gatsby doesn't so much want to repeat the past as to obliterate it, or part of it anyway, and to enable a kind of temporal do-over that will allow him and Daisy Buchanan, or now, again, Daisy Fay, to resume the relationship they were cultivating when his poverty and the Great War intervened. He believes less in time travel than in time unraveled, with Daisy as both the means and the object of his ambition to reset the clock. The change he seeks is a restoration. He wants Daisy's unwavering love for him to cause history to run backwards, and then to resume and correct it at the point where it began to go sideways. In Roughing It, Mark Twain harbors no, a, a very different ambition regarding time. He doesn't want to go back to a golden moment and start again from there. He wants to seal that golden moment away forever in an irretrievable past that is as absolutely out of reach as it may be exhilarating to remember. Nick, Car Nick Carraway tells us that no matter how much we beat on against time's current, we are borne back ceaselessly into the past. Twain releases no analogous pronouncement at the end of Roughing It, but makes clear that we are much more likely to be born or driven into a future in which the past is rightly understood to be both inaccessible and irrelevant. Change for him is the essence of nostalgia. We're best at recalling the golden moments of our past when the consequences of time passing have made them otherwise impossible to relive. In these ways and others, Roughing It continues a meditation on the human measure of time that begins to take shape in the innocence abroad. The similarities between Mark Twain's first two books may be more profound than their differences, even though their differences appear more striking. They're both travel books, for instance, although they travel in opposite directions. Innocence Abroad heads east to the old world, which does turn out to be mostly antique, with occasional outcroppings of modernity in places like Napoleon III's France. Roughing it heads to the western edge of the New World, a place so primitive or adolescent that modernity has yet to overtake it. Then, too, the two books were written out of sequence, the events of the second book having taken place six or seven years before those of the first. That is to say, Sam Clemens was about half a dozen years older when he set sail for Europe and the Holy Land than he was when he boarded a stagecoach for Virginia City. Just how old Mark Twain, or these narrators anyway, may be is harder to say. So although the Roughing It narrator often comes across as naive and tells us that he's never been away from home before, uh, before lighting out to the West, certainly something that's not true of Sam Clemens, He's quite the man of the world by the time he writes about it. I'm still talking about the roughing it narrator now, and this is confusing if nothing else. He's quite the man of the world by the time he writes about it, dropping phrases like, quote, in Syria once, unquote, and quote, this reminds me of an incident of Palestine travel, unquote. Both books are fundamentally about the past and how to imagine its relationship to the present and the future. The past in Innocence Abroad may be separated from the book's present of, say, 1868 by centuries or even millennia, while the past in Roughing It, the Goshute and other Indian nations notwithstanding, is hardly two decades old, as if nothing worth bothering about happened in the American West much before the 49ers arrived to set history in motion. In other ways, roughing it is by its very nature a flight from history, its narrator stepping or galloping away from the cataclysmic civil war it never mentions 
in favor of a demonstrably and emphatically new world in which the past barely exists and hardly matters. At the beginning of Innocence Abroad, Mark Twain is swept along by, quote, the tide of a great popular movement, to the point where he claims to be shocked to meet people who aren't also on their way to Europe. This is I'll Pay You in Paris. Roughing it is very different. It takes six days for the narrator and his brother to make their way from St. Louis to St. Joseph. Quote, a trip that was so dull and sleepy and eventless that it has left no more impression on my memory than if its duration had been six minutes instead of as many days, unquote. Once in St. Joe, they have to, quote, hunt up the stage office, unquote, to buy tickets to Carson City. This is no popular movement, and they're way too late to be 49ers. But while it may have been difficult for the brothers to begin their trip into the Wild West, Roughing It makes clear that that journey has since become impossible. Even though, uh, even though the experience Mark Twain describes there is hardly 10 years old as he writes, he insists that it is no longer available to the contemporary reader. That is, Mark Twain's West closed long before Frederick Jackson Turner's did, at least 20 years before. If, following Nick Carraway, we imagine time or human history as a river, both Twain and Turner are saying that time's river occasionally shifts, abandoning some of its former course and making that course inaccessible. Under these circumstances, there can be no boats against the current, because these currents have ceased to flow. We can't be borne back into these pasts, even if we want to be. They have become, in the way we often use the term to signal a kind of finality, historical. In the prefatory to Roughing It, Mark Twain refers to the moment the book describes as, quote, an interesting episode in the history of the Far West, a curious episode in some respects, the only one of its particular kind that has occurred in the land, and the only one, indeed, that is likely to occur in it." Unquote. The implication is this one-of-a-kind episode has clearly and forever ended. It can be recollected and memorialized, but not replicated or experienced. In Innocence Abroad, Twain recognizes the broadening effects of traveling and seeing the wider world and urges his reader to travel in order to experience that broadening. There is no parallel recommendation in Roughing It. Even readers of the first edition had lost their chance to be part of the, quote, curious adventure, unquote, except, of course, retrospectively, via the hefty book in their lap or on their coffee table. And while it may be true that Roughing It is told more or less chronologically, its essential organization, especially early on, is spatial, not temporal. Its first chapters are literally set off by mile markers, allowing an interplay of time and space that anticipates Einstein and early 20th century physics. Paradoxically, as the Roughing It narrator moves west or forward in narrative time, in these early chapters. He moves backward in, my, in, in what might be called developmental or even evolutionary time. That is, he seems not only to grow younger, at one point in Utah, in the presence of Brigham Young being mistaken for a child, but to travel back in human history toward ever more primitive, barbaric, uncivilized, and uncultured circumstances. His most positive word for these conditions or realities is wild. There may be an emphatic contrast between the slovenly behavior of, say, the hostlers at the stage stations on the one hand and the strapping, unpolished virility of the vigorous, unspoiled young men the narrator finds in the West. But both are born of this fleeting, faded wrinkle in space-time. Those vigorous young men also, paradoxically, have ceased to exist by 1870, 
when Mark Twain is writing Ruffing. Presumably, and perhaps like him, they haven't so much been exterminated as civilized, as if by an onslaught of Widow Douglas's or of Elmira Langdon's, as well as by the seeming march of progress, emblematized and made real in roughing it by the Transcontinental Railroad. And you may remember that this is a dining car in which you can order a Delmonico dinner, if you wish. And this is Mark Twain's present as he's writing the book, but the future of the roughing it he describes. About that seeming march of progress, maybe the lesson of a later book, A Connecticut Yankee, is that human progress is an illusion and that therefore, in many senses, time is meaningless. All the technological advances the Yankee embodies is finally undone and rendered irrelevant by the relentless persistence of a flat, vain, selfish, unchanging human nature. The human saga is finally picaresque at best, and progress an illusion, or worse, a, fund a fundamental misconstruction of the nature of things. Like the Battle of the Sand Belt, the American West into which Roughing It takes us shows that civilization is a fragile, faded veneer. Much, like, much of Mark Twain's irreverent humor depends on the contrast between this, this pompous, threadbare exterior and the persistent, relentless realities it masks. Or is it, in Roughing It anyway, the other way around? Doesn't the coming of civilization to the West bring, it, bring with it real transformative power? Women and schoolhouses and churches promise genuine radical change and are in fact reasons for reasons those strapping young stalwarts cease to exist, just as the technological accomplishments of the Transcontinental Railroad will banish the stagecoach and shorten the distance and therefore the time between East and West, from 20 days by stagecoach, roughing it tells its readers, to four and a half days by train. Mark Twain would seem to take little interest in chronicling the advance of civilization that overtakes his young Western stalwarts. He makes clear that it will happen, has in fact happened, but he draws the curtain on roughing it before he has to have any part in telling about it. Now, for all its paradoxes and conundrums, quantum mechanics is surprisingly old school about time, allowing it, and maybe it alone, for the most part, to function as what the physicists call a smooth constant in a dynamic, fidgety reality that maintains, for instance, that that cat of Schrodinger's is both alive and dead until we look into the box where we put it. So now I'm going to freelance a little bit about that cat. Um, Erwin Schrodinger was one of the physicists of the early and middle 20th century who brought quantum mechanics into existence. And quantum mechanics came because classic mechanics, the standard model, were found to be insufficient to explain the world in which we live, especially when we got the ability to examine that world at its smallest, tiniest scale. And so quantum mechanics was born out of that necessity. And among the things that quantum mechanics came to claim was this capacity for quantum objects to maintain these seemingly impossible uh, disparities simultaneously. And so initially, anyway, uh, Schrodinger took upon himself to uh, um, make fun of this uh, habit of his colleagues by imagining, by creating the thought experiment in which a cat is put into a sealed chamber, a box, in which there is also a gimmick that has a 50-50 chance of killing the cat over the course of an hour. The gimmick involves radioactivity and a hammer that breaks a vial 
releases poison that kills the cat. And Schrodinger said of this box with the cat in it, this is essentially what we're saying about quantum objects, that they exist as the cat will for us, he argues, as both alive and dead until the moment when we open the box and have to observe which it is. It's that simultaneity. It's the cat before we open. It's the quantum world before we look at it, before we observe it, that quantum mechanics is all about. We'll get into what observation has to do with this in a minute. Quantum physics insists that apparently contradictory states, alive, dead, up, down, coexist simultaneously until they are fixed in one way or the other by observation. The physicists call this fixing of suspended possibilities a collapse. Fitzgerald and Twain, and I'm going to put up here one of their favorite experiments that maybe we'll have a time to talk about. Fitzgerald and Twain, and probably the rest of us, see time as a linear constant too, like the quantum physicists. But both of them tease us with characters who want to fuss with that linearity in ways that even the quantum physicists won't. Rothingit, in particular, argues that that linearity is unidirectional. As Twain himself said, I do not move backwards. Especially in the waning days of his bachelorhood, when he was writing the early chapters of Roughing It, Sam Clemens was not about to live backwards or to write a book that seemed to want to. He was anxious to, to secure and maintain the approval of the Langdon family and, astonishingly, as far as he was concerned, to marry Olivia Langdon. This was not the moment to be caught yearning for a Gatsby-like return to the, quote, wild sense of freedom of those fine Overland mornings that Ruffing it celebrates. Which is to say that many of the ambivalences we associate with Ruffing it follow from and reflect Twain's own quantum state at the time of writing it. So here is Schrodinger's cat represented graphically. And I'd like this to serve as a kind of a totem for Mark Twain's quantum state as well. Was he the wild humorist of the Pacific Slope or a candidate for gentility fit to take his place in the Langdon parlor? And then these kinds of visual puzzles seem to me to have another way of representing quantum realities. So what you see here depends on how you look. And how you look, you might say, collapses the what we would otherwise call ambiguities, but the doubleness of this image. Which way is this figure looking? The way you see it will collapse it into one way or the other, perhaps. I'll have a couple other things. And these seem like good metaphors for me, or, or totems, for how the quantum imagination works. Do Twain's experiences in Roughing It describe the transformation of a tenderfoot? Or does he remain, even at the end of the book, essentially an innocent, only now with a better half? Is the American West a transformative Eden, or a violent maw that devours young men and their dreams? So here's another one. This is a harder one, right? Yeah. We'll work on this. In the world of quantum mechanics, polarities like these aren't mutually exclusive, but can be held by the agency of superposition in a single identity. Quantum physics describes a universe of very small things. Electrons, photons, bosons, and the other tiny bits and forces that often hold together in dynamic equilibrium opposites and competing possibilities in ways that are impossible in the larger world they ultimately structure. Isn't that remarkable? <laughs> the, the, the reality, these are not metaphors. The reality of the world, quantum physics claims, at the very tiniest scale, functions by a set of principles or realities 
that do not obtain in the uh, that do not obtain in, in the way we experience the larger world in which we live. So do we experience, uh, we don't experience, we don't see these kinds of doublenesses, except maybe in books like Roughing It, where coyotes are at once the beautifully adapted Lamborghinis of the prairie and the disreputable Daewoods at the same time, where the outlaw Slade has it in him to be both a man of dainty manners and wild sprees, and where gold itself can be imagined to be so pure as to corrupt a prospector with longing. Or think finally of the roughing it narrator. This is not the roughing it narrator, but again, that kind of simultaneity. The roughing it narrator. Somebody we call the roughing it narrator because we have no better way to refer to him. I mean, he's not exactly Mark Twain, even though he's the first person teller of a book and Mark Twain is the name on its cover. For one thing, most people knew and still know that Mark Twain himself, whatever that may mean, wasn't exactly or entirely Mark Twain. That Samuel Clemens played a role behind or alongside him and that the relationship wasn't always a tidy one, each having a way of spilling into the other. Particularly, I would say, in roughing it. If you think of, or try to think of, the relationship between those two figures, and there was an interesting discussion this morning of how sometimes he's Twain and sometimes he's Clemens. Um, this is a little more than that. I mean, in roughing it, he is simultaneously, in some ways, Twain and Clemens, who is that person who, with his brother, heads into the West? It's always seemed to me that neither Samuel Clemens nor Mark Twain went out of his way to resolve or even to be bothered by this intimate twinning. Instead, he occupied both identities vigorously and not so much sequentially as simultaneously. That is, he wasn't Twain around the office and Clemens back at the house, or Twain on the lecture platform and Clemens backstage. He was often, here in Elmira, for instance, both at once, maintaining on quite a grand scale what on a very, very tiny scale is called superposition. The person who wrote Roughing It would go on as Clemens to most who knew him, but Mark to some others, he would sign some letters S.L. Clemens and some Mark Twain and some both ways at once as if to provide superposition with a signature. Now how about this one? Yeah. He even designed a monogram for his correspondence that intertwined the two, celebrating their entanglement. So the roughing it narrator comes by his double pedigree honestly, early in Mark Twain's career, not as an indication of Twain's inexperience as a writer with a simple pseudonym, but as a complicated, entangled personality whose entanglement would only deepen as his life and career went on. I'm afraid there is such a thing as quantum entanglement, a phenomenon Einstein himself referred to as, quoting now, spooky action at a distance, unquote. We have no time to go there this lovely purple Elmira afternoon, but let's do this again in four years and see what happens. Meanwhile, that cat of Schrodinger's will abide not just in his box, but in our imagination, both with us and not and in that regard, resembling no one so much as Mark Twain himself. Thank you. <laughs>